grace and peace. Apostle Cheryl is here. We are here. We are here. We're going to um, start hanging, folks. Um, we pray that you're having an amazing day and that you are looking forward to entering into a new year, accomplishing great things, going closer to the Lord. We're going to take a few minutes to tag you and give you time to share and let people know that we are live. Um, it only takes a second to share. Just hit that share button. Uh, you can feel free to host a watch party regarding any of our uh, discussions around domestic violence. Okay, you don't need my permission to do that. I'm giving you blanket permission now. Feel free to share on all of your social media platforms um, as you help us partner with us in getting the word out and letting people have a greater understanding of domestic violence because we know how prevalent it is and so today our topic is psychological abuse we thank you for joining us as I stated previously I am Apostle Cheryl Richardson and um, we love the Lord and we are mantled and mandated to bring attention and to raise awareness regarding domestic violence because it has a devastating impact on us as individuals, on our families, our communities, our cities, our state, our nations, um, and the world. It impacts absolutely everything. Uh, it impacts the economics um, that a nation depends on. It impacts everything. The ability for a victim to be productive at work, their ability to maintain employment, the ability for an employer to rely on its workforce to be consistently productive. So all these things that matter to all of us, if we're currently involved and snared in an abusive relationship or not, we are impacted indirectly because there's a real good chance that the person sitting next to us at work sitting next to us in our place of worship, in line next to us, in front of us or behind us, in the grocery store is being impacted. The person who's ringing up the groceries may be impacted and that may impact their ability to be efficient. Your doctor, your lawyer, okay? The judge that's determining your case. Because abuse knows no boundaries. And so as you hear me say often, Anyone can be a victim and anyone can be an abuser. And so it's important that we are all educated so that we know how to respond, so that we know what the signs are. And what we've done since July is every week we've come on with a different aspect of domestic violence. And there are so many ways in which it affects us that the topics are really endless. <laughs> Um, and so we're going to wrap up this year, continuing to educate and to raise awareness. And today we're going to be talking about psychological abuse. It's important um, to be able to recognize that so that we know when it's occurring. It's very, very subtle. It's very, very subtle. And for many of us, our religious beliefs or the beliefs that we embrace around spirituality and and God and, and who God is and what God expects of us impacts our ability to recognize abuse when it's taking place. Now, although many of our discussions focus on abuse in terms of intimate partner relationship, um, we're also very, very concerned about the effect that it has on childhood development, the impact it has on family stability, uh, its relationship to gun violence and sexual assault and things of this nature, um, human trafficking. Um, it's very, very insidious, as I said. Um, so I'd appreciate it if you would share on all of your social media platforms. Uh, feel free to chime in. There are many uh, friends that I have here on social media. Most of you I also know personally because I've lived all over the country. Um, in a few places overseas and the Lord has blessed me to establish some very meaningful relationships and so I thank God for you 
Um, but many of you, I know, and many of you are mental health professionals, as I am. You are a ministry leader, as I am. Um, you love people. <laughs> you love to travel or whatever. So we have a lot in common. And so many of you, some of you are psychologists, some of you are psychiatrists. Um, and so I know you have an opinion about the things that we're discussing. So feel free to chime in, share your knowledge. We are stronger together, right? We are better together. We can make a greater impact together. And for those of you who are going to be joining this as a replay, I appreciate you taking the time to tune in and prayerfully it will be um, informational for you and inspiring for you. Uh, hopefully you'll learn something that you didn't already know or be reminded of something that you knew but hadn't thought about recently. I'm trying to tag as many of you as I can and I'm going to rely on you all to do some tagging when I am done. I think I'm going to tag maybe five more people. I think I've tagged a bunch, so we shall see. Okay, so I'm Apostle Cheryl Richardson, and we today are talking about psychological abuse. And for all of you who came on while I was tagging, blessings to you. Hey, Keith, one of my dearest friends. We've known each other forever. We were like kids trying to be grown when we met, right? In the military. <laughs> so blessings to you. Latanya. Hey, Cousin Howard. Love you. So we're going to talk about psychological abuse. Now, you might be wondering, well, why do you want to talk about that? Well, I think we need to talk about it because it's so insidious. Most of the time, when it's this happening, it's not recognized. And a lot of times it's not recognized even by the person who's experiencing it. Okay, so if you don't know that you're being mistreated, there's no reason to make adjustments or to address it. Amen. And it doesn't minimize the negative effect that it has on you. The fact that you don't know what it is doesn't make it any less potentially lethal, okay? And so, again, thank you for sharing. I'm Apostle Cheryl Richardson. We're talking about psychological abuse, and we're going to talk about why it is so important that we recognize it. And for many of us, that we acknowledge that this is what we are experiencing if, in fact, we find at the end of this discussion that, hmm, that sounds really, really familiar, okay? So... I'm going to give you some information from the National Coalition Against Domestic Violence. And I think it's important, and we've talked about this before, that whenever we're talking about a thing, right, that we define, um, that we define it. So, what is psychological abuse? If anybody wants to take a shot at that, feel free to throw it up there. I love it when you guys participate as well, because we can all learn and grow together, okay? Hey, Ree. Hi to everyone who's watching that I've not yet acknowledged. I appreciate you. Hey, Joseph, you be safe on those roads, sir. Okay, so psychological abuse involves trauma to the victim caused by verbal abuse, um, abusive acts, threats of acts, or coercive control tactics. Perpetrators use psychological abuse to control, terrorize, and demean their victims. It frequently occurs prior to or in tandem with, along with, okay, physical or sexual abuse. So let's look at that again. Psychological abuse involves trauma to the victim caused by verbal abuse or acts, threats of acts, or coercive control tactics. And we've talked about coercive control in a previous discussion. So go back to that one if you need a refresher, okay? Perpetrators use psychological abuse to control, terrorize, and demean their victims. Hey, Larry. It frequently occurs prior to or in tandem with, along with, physical or sexual abuse. So I can't think of a single case of physical or sexual abuse that I'm aware of in over 30 years of being a mental health professional that did not involve verbal abuse or psychological abuse of some sort on the front end. It's almost like the boundaries are being tested up front. And then the perpetrator determines just how much they can get away with. How big of a chance do they feel like taking, okay? So, hey Eloise. 
Um, so we're going to look at that. Now I'm going to give you some stats because I like to give you statistics so that you understand that this is not just my opinion. And it's not even just based on the experience that I've gleaned over 30 years and dealing with this in childhood as well as in adulthood, but that there are statistics to bear out what I'm saying to you, okay? And I am adamantly opposed. Hey, Prophet Darrell, I'm adamantly opposed to anybody just taking anybody's word for something. Do your due diligence, determine, ascertain that it is true, and then whatever, whatever warfare, whatever prayer, whatever action you bring to it is based on knowledge and not just a feeling and not just a hunch, okay? And then that way you can move forward in confidence knowing that what you're addressing is an actual issue. Hey, Elkie, my buddy from Alaska, I miss you. So here are some statistics. 48.4% of women and 48.8% of men. Listen to that. And if you want to capture what I'm saying, feel free, okay? Type it in. 48.4% of women and 48.8% of men have experienced at least one psychologically aggressive behavior by an intimate partner. Hi, y'all. 48.4% of women. Now, listen to what I'm saying, and I want somebody to tell me what you think this means in the grand scheme of things. 48.4% of women and 48.8% of men have experienced at least one psychologically aggressive behavior by an intimate partner. That's almost a 50-50 split. So what does that mean in terms of our interactions with one another? Men to women, right? So it makes it clear, it makes it clear that women are slightly more prone to engage in psychological abuse. Not by a whole lot. Okay, but that kind of throws a monkey wrench in the idea that only women are victims, right? And you hear us say here just about every time we come on that men are victims too. And so I want to make that abundantly clear. Men are victims too. And if 48.4% of women, okay, have experienced psychological aggressive behavior by an intimate partner at least one time, at least one time, and 48.8% of men have experienced it at least one time. That's a whole lot of negativity, right? Being thrown back and forth, back and forth. So let's just establish that up front. That men are victims as well as women in domestic violence, okay? And today we're talking about psychological abuse. All right. Uh, thank you for sharing and liking and hearts and all that good stuff. Feel free to do a watch party when we're done. We want to make sure that people are educated regarding domestic violence and all of the tentacles that come off of it, okay, so that we can better address it, even within our own homes and communities and cities and states, nations, right, and worldwide. Okay, here's another stat for you. Four in 10 women and four in 10 men have experienced at least one form of of coercive control by an intimate partner in their lifetime. Four in 10 women and four in 10 men. So again, what that bears out is that this is something that men do to women and that women do to men. It's not just men doing it to women, okay? So coercive control tactics is really manipulation. And if you're a person of faith, right? If you're a person of faith, if you're a Christian and this is going on, it's witchcraft is what it is. It's, it's, it's trying to force you to do something that you're not wanting to do of your own volition, of your own free will. So it's trying to establish an atmosphere in which you feel that you have no choice, but to do what is being asked of you to do. Okay. Hey, Marielle. So coercive control is really witchcraft. That's what it is. All right. It's manipulation if you don't want to be spiritual with it. Either way, you're trying to get something from someone that you're pretty sure they won't give you unless you change the way they're looking at the situation, okay? That's what manipulation is. And I'm going to tell you, and this is just my assessment. It's disrespectful. And if you're dealing with me, if you know me personally, you know that this is 
how I live. This is where I live. Just say what you want. It's going to be yes or no. Okay. It's, it's going to be yes or no. And I don't have to start my apostolic gift or my prophetic anointing to have a right to say yes or no. As a human being, right? We have a right to say yes or no to those things that we have control over. And it's nice if other people approve, but it's not necessary that they approve. And that their approval or lack thereof does not diminish your right to say yes or no. So when we engage in coercive control tactics, and when we engage in manipulation, and when we treat others this way, we're operating in witchcraft. We're operating in manipulation, okay? And we're trying to get something that we don't have a right to have unless the owner wants to release it, okay? All right, I'm not taking it back. Now, what does it include? What does it include? So psychological abuse, and, and I want to talk about the ways that it manifests, the ways that it presents so that you understand that if it's happening or <laughs> if you're doing it, okay? You don't have to type on here if you're doing it. If you, if you feel like being transparent, we are here for you. You feel free to throw that up there, okay? But it's not a requirement. All right. So psychological abuse includes humiliating the victim, saying or doing something that humiliates them, that embarrasses them, okay? Uh, critiquing them about something that they have no control over, critiquing them or reminding them of something in their past that maybe was less than stellar, less than amazing, okay? Um, certainly if it's something that they've atoned for or something that they've apologized for and something that they've already, if it's criminal, served their time for and we continue to bring it up and we continue to remind them of their shortcomings. First of all, you assume a position that you don't have any shortcomings, which is very arrogant and inaccurate, right? So that's not okay. So humiliating the victim is psychological abuse, no matter who's doing it. Controlling what the victim can and cannot do. That can be literally controlling. That can be um, putting you into a mindset, putting the victim into a mindset that they don't have any control gaslighting them, continuing to work on them until they accept that they don't have any say in what they can and cannot do, all right? Withholding information from the victim. I'm going to say that one again. Withholding information. Withholding information from the victim is psychological abuse. Why? Why do you say that, Apostle? Glad you asked, Okay. Withholding information because it's a coercive control tactic. What would happen if they had all of the information? Hmm, probably something that you don't want them to do. And this is why the information is being withheld, okay? Or perhaps you don't want to deal with the consequence of something that you've done, a decision that you've made. So you withhold information. So in a relationship that would otherwise be healthy, withholding information from the victim, okay, is psychological abuse because, thank you, Mario, because you are allowing them to move forward thinking that they have all of the information. The decision that they make may very well, at least you don't think it would be the same one, be different, right? And so we make decisions based on what we think is best at that time, right? And so if I'm making a decision based on what I think is best at the time, I'm assuming I have all of the information. And if you're an intimate partner, or if you're a close family friend, or if you're a relative, you're someone that I've invested trust in, I'm assuming, right, that without reading you your rights and all that good stuff, and putting you on the oath, I'm assuming that you're giving me all the information so that I can make the best possible decision. And so when psychological abuse is in operation, information is withheld, okay, so that the outcome can be impacted without the victim's knowledge, okay, without the victim's knowledge. This is why sometimes people do things and it doesn't make any, it doesn't make any sense. It doesn't make any sense because they're not operating under the same set of facts that you are. They're thinking that the circumstances are, are lined up one way, and in reality, they're lined up a completely different way. Okay, so a lot of times when we look at what other people are choosing or deciding, they don't know all that we know, 
or the facts as they know them are different from the facts as we know them, okay? And so maybe that'll help us and not be so judgmental as well. So withholding information from the victim, this is a very subtle, subtle thing, and we can think we have a good reason for doing it, okay? But if it's not their birthday and it's not a surprise that they would be thrilled about, it's psychological abuse. All right. Deliberately doing something to make the victim feel diminished or embarrassed. This is when the perpetrator, whoever it is, sets out, I'm trying to hurt you. I'm trying to embarrass you. I'm trying to humiliate you because I'm trying to either cause you to do something or prevent you from doing something. Okay. I'm trying to control you, but I don't want to, it to appear that I'm controlling you. I want you to respond to the scenario as I set it up and it will appear to everybody else that you're making this wackadoodle decision, that you're being unreasonable, okay? And so again, deliberately doing something to make the victim feel diminished or embarrassed. And I'm telling you nine times out of 10, it's because you want to respond. There's a particular response that they're after. There's a particular response. If you're the perpetrator, there's a particular response that you're after. You're wanting to cause something or to prevent something, and you don't want it to appear that you've influenced it. My grandmother, my chickadee, my mama would call it throwing the rock and hiding your hand, okay? That's what they would call that. Throwing the rock and hiding your hand. Acting like you have no idea why they decided such a thing, okay? Now, another way that you can recognize it is it's isolating the victim from friends and or family. Now, there are many ways, and if you all can think of some ways that I've not addressed, hey Cassie, then feel free to pop them up here. But isolating the victim from family or friends can be running back and forth between the two and tattletaling or trying to influence their relationship or trying to cause a breach, a break for your own selfish reasons. You've got your own motives now for doing this. And I'm going to reference my grandmother and my chickadee one more time and say, they would always tell me that any dog that will bring a bone will carry one. Somebody please type that up there. Any dog that will bring a bone will carry one also. No exception. They didn't say only Labradors did it. They didn't say only Poodles did it. Any dog, the mutt, it don't matter. All right. You want to look at the motivation of the person who's bringing you this information. What is in it for them? What dog do they have in the fight, okay? So isolating the victim can look like causing a breach. It can look like I'm constantly negatively talking about this person in your ear or you're constantly negatively talking about this person in my ear. You're trying to affect, impact the way I view them. And particularly if you are really, really pushy with it, okay? You get upset when I don't agree with you that they are the scourge of the earth that they are a slug that crawled out from under a rock. If I don't agree with you, you get upset with me. And that's concerning. It's like, why are you so invested? Why do you need for me not to want to have anything to do with these people? Why can you not respect that I have a right to decide if I'm going to be involved with them or not? If I'm going to be their friend or not? If I'm going to go to lunch with them or not? Okay? And so don't get fooled by the feigned concern. Okay? Isolating the victim from friends and her family is a typical standard trick in the bag for an abusive person. You will hardly ever find a situation in which isolation is not a part because it flourishes in isolation. It diminishes the victim's opportunity to get recentered in terms of how they're viewing their situation. It robs them of an opportunity to have something to compare it to. This is what's happening in my relationship and this is what everybody else is experiencing. And these two things are not even closely, closely related. All right? All right. And so another thing that you can see is denying the victim's access to money or other basic resources. Controlling all the money. Now, I'm not talking about those couples who have an agreement because one of them knows that they are horrible with money and they want to shop all the time and they acknowledge that this is a problem and they give control of the finances over to the one who was more responsible you know, not prone to shopping, that will make sure that the bills get paid and all of that. All right? Not talking about that. Not talking about that. So don't get distracted by anybody who may tell you, well, but he's better at the finances or she's better at the finances and we're not talking to you. Talking about the person who has to ask for gas money, has to ask for pantyhose money, 
has to ask for money to go to the barbershop and get a haircut. Has to ask and has to convince and has to convey that it's an emergent situation in order to get it. And this person may work a full 40 hour job or a part time job and have no access to their own paycheck. No access whatsoever. Okay. Um, it may be hidden in the form of an allowance that's unreasonable because it's not enough for you to do what you need to do, even if you're being responsible on a day-to-day -day basis. Maybe you have to ask for gas money every two days because you're only given enough, right? So you want to pay attention to, do you have access to the things that you need on a day-to-day -day basis with all of your little shortcomings taken into consideration, okay? Do you have enough to not feel humiliated and to not feel demeaned, okay? Stalking. Um, we've done an entire uh, discussion on stalking. We've talked about it more than once. It is very, very, very critical and it's important. I, I want you all to understand that January, right, is National Stalking Awareness Month. And this is like the 16th year um, that it's been recognized and has been given a month of its own even separate from Domestic Violence Awareness Month, which is in October, okay? So January is National Stalking Awareness Month. Would someone please type that up there? Um, and we're going to spend a lot of time talking about the intricacies of stalking, um, how serious and how prevalent it is, uh, so that you can have a better understanding of what that looks like and what it leads up to, okay? Uh, but stalking and it's very, very dangerous. So if you're being stalked, you have a very serious problem. Very serious problem. And I'm going to tell you something. If it is an intimate partner or a former intimate partner that is stalking you, you have a greater chance than anybody else of being murdered by the person who's stalking you. Okay? Not trying to scare you. We're not into scare tactics. But we really do believe, hey, Stephen, that we need to be aware uh, we need to make informed decisions and we need to understand. You need to have all the information. It would be abusive for me to have this information, right? And not share it. And not share it. Because I know that people don't know. They don't understand the seriousness of it. So it would be abusive. I would have to answer to God if I didn't tell you these things. So I'll be telling you everything he tells me to tell you. Rest assured, okay? All right. Demeaning the victim in public or private. In public or private. Okay, we're entering the holiday season. We're right in, 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 the, in the heart of the holiday season. There are a lot of holiday parties, a lot of, of things that, that you may have to attend. Family, you know, get-togethers, family gatherings, church gatherings, ministry gatherings, whatever it is, workplace gatherings. Um, and maybe you dread going because you know that your partner is going to clown. You know they're going to say something. You know they're going to be attention-seeking. You know they're going to be embarrassing or whatever. How many of you have social engagements coming up and you are praying to God that your person does not want to go? Doesn't want to go. Doesn't, you, you don't want them to go. You don't want them to go and you don't care if they get mad and don't go or if they are glad and don't go or if they feel like they're harming you. Hey, Dar, if you feel, they feel like they're harming you by not going. Your prayer inside, if you're in a psychologically abusive relationship, is that you are praying that they don't go. And the reason why it doesn't even matter, okay? That's an indication that you're in a psychologically abusive relationship because on some level, you know that you're going to be demeaned or embarrassed or humiliated if you are in public with this person who will now have access to people that you interact with all the time at your church or at your ministry or in your workplace, okay? Um, undermining the victim's confidence and or sense of self-worth. This, to me, is one of the worst things you can do to a person, is to undermine their confidence and or sense of self-worth. When a person's interaction with you causes them to feel like they have no value, that they don't matter, that their opinion carries no weight, that their opinion doesn't matter, that they make horrible decisions and they, can, or they aren't capable of growing um, and evolving, into a better person, that they're not capable of walking in their purpose or in their destiny. This is one of this is the one of the worst things you can do to a person. This is evil. Point blank period. Full stop. Okay. So when you do that, if a person's interaction with you, I don't care if it's me. If after they interact with you, they don't feel more empowered, 
they don't feel more confident and like they have value if their interaction with you or if your interaction with them does not leave you feeling more centered and strengthened and undergirded there's a very real possibility that you're dealing with someone who is abusing you psychologically okay but then another thing you want to look for is convincing the victim that she or he is crazy convincing them now this involves gaslighting this it can can this can get so intense that it involves doing things like you always leave your car keys in a particular place hey ro you always leave hey misty you always leave your car keys in a particular place but they're not there and you tear up the house or the apartment or whatever looking for them and they help you look for them and mysteriously they find them they find them hey dr Saxena. they find them okay they found them because they moved them okay and if that happens enough you start to question your ability to remember things to remember what you're doing from one minute to the next over time that erodes your self-confidence okay and so that's another thing that can happen when you're in a psychologically abusive relationship now as i've said before we focus a lot on intimate partner relationships but psychological abuse is something that can occur in any relationship it can be a parent-child relationship it can be a sibling to sibling relationship it can be a cousin to cousin relationship co-worker to co-worker employer to employee employee to employer okay this is something that can exist in any relationship at all all right but we're talking about intimate partner violence that's where our focus is on today okay here's some more stats for you 17.9 percent of women have experienced a situation where an intimate partner tried to isolate them from family and friends 17.9 percent of women have experienced this where an intimate partner tried to isolate them from family and friends okay it can be as simple as them trying to discourage you from attending your place of worship well you know that's a cult well you know i don't know about those people over there they're a little strange over there okay they're a little strange over there here's a suggestion invite them to go with you if you're worried about my safety why don't you go with me go with me make sure i'm safe okay but they'll try to convince you and this again is a part of the whole the whole isolation piece okay the isolation piece is key if you look at your life honestly how free are you to interact with your friends how free are you to do that how big of an issue is it when you want to interact with family all right why is it such a big deal why do they feel threatened by that okay all right so we know isolation is key and again 17.9 percent of women have experienced a situation where an intimate partner tried to isolate them from family and friends 18.7 percent of women have been threatened with physical harm by an intimate partner 18.7 percent have been threatened with physical harm these words were spoken i'm going to hurt you i'm going to do this to you i'm going to slap you i'm going to do this that and the other to you okay so remember now psychological abuse is uh the behavior but it's also the threat of the behavior that's psychologically abusive because it attempts to re-establish to crash and move boundaries to, to push them back all right uh, with your cooperation getting you to co-sign hey Roz getting you to co-sign on your boundary being crashed all right now 95 percent of men who physically abuse their intimate partners also psychologically abuse them all right it's very very hard to jump right into physical abuse and for the perpetrator to feel justified in doing so they've got to create an atmosphere of fear they've got to create an atmosphere of intimidation even if it's all unspoken even if it's unspoken if they've engaged in these psychologically abusive behaviors they have set your mind in such a place where you understand that they're capable of doing more that they're capable of harming you physically that they're capable of sexually assaulting you right you understand that they're capable of this and so there are certain other things that they don't need to say but 95 percent of men who physically abuse their intimate partners also psychologically abuse them why because if they don't 
if they don't get the victim to a place psychologically where they believe that they have no choice but to accept it, even in that moment, they might not say, I'm going to live like this the rest of my life. But in that moment, they decide, I just have to go along with this. I just have to acquiesce to this. I just have to submit to this. Okay, if we're talking about somebody misappropriating scripture, I just have to submit to this. Um, if they don't get you there first, there's a really great chance that you're not going to go along with the foolishness. You're not going to submit to being physically abused. You will not go along with being sexually assaulted, not without a fight, okay? So they need your cooperation. They need to convince you. If you want to look at it from a spiritual standpoint, the enemy needs for you to agree with him that you deserve somehow what is being done to you. They need for you to accept that you have no value. They need for you to accept that your word has no meaning, okay? They need that. It makes it easier for them to over, overtake you, overtake your thought processes, uh, engage in more coercive control, become physically abusive if that's what they choose they want to do, engage in sexual assault if that's what they feel they want to do. Okay. Hey, Dr. Jen. So we're talking about psychological abuse today and we're talking about what it looks like because it's important and we're talking about the prevalence of it so that we understand it's important that we abandon this mindset that only women are abused by men. Women, and it's almost a 50-50 split, engage in psychologically abusive behavior towards men as well. Okay? So men are victims too, and it's important that we understand that. Women who are, women who are, this was fascinating. So think about this. Think about this in your own life. Those of you who may find yourself in this situation, but women who earn 65% or more of their household income are more likely to be psychologically abused than women who earn less than 65% of their household income. Women who earn 65% of their household income are more likely to be psychologically abused than women who earn less than 65% of their household income. So, if for sure you are a professional woman, if you are a psychologist, you're an attorney, you're a judge, um, you're an investor on Wall Street, you make really good money, okay? If you make more than 65% of your household income, you are more likely to experience psychological abuse. Somebody throw up there why you think that might be the case. Why do you think that is? There's a reason for that. If you earn 65% or more. And you don't have to be a billionaire. You don't have to be a millionaire. Okay? You, you, that doesn't have to be the case. If your intimate partner makes $5 an hour, and you make more than that, you make 65% of the household income. That means you are carrying the household. You are carrying the household. You have a whole lot of influence on the day-to-day -day needs, right? On the roof over the head, on the utilities being paid, on the groceries in the refrigerator and in the pantry. You have a whole lot of uh, impact, a whole lot of power. And so how do you undermine someone who has a whole lot of power on a day-to-day -day basis in every area of your life? You cause them to question their own self-worth. You cause them to question if they're a good person or not. You cause them to question if they're crazy. If you can get them to question themselves and to question their value and to question their worth, an abusive person can still take control of the household even though you make 65% or more of the income, okay? And remember now, one of the ways that psychological abuse manifests is withholding information, right? Humiliating, um, talking down to, embarrassing in public or in private. And so you, uh, you would do that a perpetrator would do that to gain control. It doesn't matter how much money you make. It doesn't matter because you're not going to take any of these things away if you come under their control from a psychological standpoint, okay? Does everybody understand that? Okay. And again, feel free 
to share on your social media platform. Share, share, share. Like, Instagram, all that good stuff. Twitter, feel free to share, okay? And put your comments up here. Like I said, I have many friends, and I know you all personally, um, who understand what I'm talking about. And so feel free to chime in, share your perspective, share anything that you think I might be missing, okay? Psychological abuse increases um, the trauma of physical and sexual abuse. And so there's there's the physical abuse that a, that a victim endures, right? And then there's the physical abuse that a sexual assault victim may endure. But what increases the trauma to them are the things that are spoken in the psychological abuse that has been levied against them in order to bring them under control in the first place. Okay? Sexual assaults typically don't happen by somebody just walking up to you and sexually assaulting you. There are things that are said. There are things that are inferred. There might be a weapon used. There might be threats uttered. So psychological abuse is key in bringing you to a place where you decide that the best thing for you to do as a victim is to submit to the abuse. Okay? Psychological abuse increases the trauma of physical and sexual abuse. Often victims tell you that, you know, my arm was broken or my orbital socket was broken or this occurred or that occurred. But what they said to me is stuck in my head. I can't get what they said out of my head. They said this and that and the other. They threatened to do this to my family, to my children, to my parents, to my pets. They told me that nobody would believe me because they were in a position of power. They told me that nobody would believe me because they were a minister or they were a doctor or they were a police officer or they were an attorney. They had this great image in the community and nobody would believe me. They told me that nobody would believe me because of my past mistakes. They told me nobody would believe me because I was a convicted felon or because I have a criminal record. Um, nobody would believe that I had changed. Nobody would believe that they were treating me the way that they were treating me because they're so jovial and warm and engaging in public, okay? That is psychological abuse. It's psychological abuse and it's bondage is what it is, okay? Now, let's talk about the impact. Victims of psychological abuse often suffer long-term damage in their mental health, experiencing anxiety, okay, which can be debilitating. Anxiety, the, the underpinning of it is I am convinced that I am not equipped to handle whatever I think is going to happen next. Whatever it is, I can't handle it. Whatever it is, I can't handle it, okay? So anxiety, depression, suicidal ideation, low self-esteem, self-harming behaviors like cutting, things like that, Hey, Mayor. Um, so self-harming behaviors, post-traumatic stress disorder, low self-esteem, and difficulty trusting others. Now, why is, do they have difficulty trusting others? Well, if they've been ex exposed to psychological abuse, they've come to believe that they can't trust their own judgment. Or if they've been in and out of a series of abusive relationships, they understand that for some reason, they keep making horrible choices in terms of who to trust. So they have difficulty in trusting others, even if the others are in fact trustworthy. And this is based on what they've experienced in the past, okay? And so psychological abuse has this long-standing impact on the victim. It really truly does. Going forward, even after they leave an abusive situation, they the impact continues. And this is why it's important that people get into therapy, that they get into counseling, that they get into a support group that not focuses all the time on what they've lost or what they have suffered, but that has an overall focus on moving forward, not sweeping anything under the rug, but a balance in addressing the abuse, in addressing the trauma, um, in identifying what the trauma is, but in moving forward and healing, not to wallow in it, not to get stuck in it, not to get the the, the psychological high off of how horrible it was um, and the ensuing support and comfort that we're understanding that we get from people when we tell them what we have endured, okay? But a person who is really, really wanting to move forward at some point wants to be strengthened. They want to be strengthened, okay? 
They don't want to continually rehearse what they've experienced um, and immerse themselves in that pain over and over and over again. At that point, you're abusing yourself, okay? All right. Subtle psychological abuse is more damaging than overt psychological abuse or direct aggression. Now, why do you think this is? Subtle psychological abuse is more damaging than overt psychological abuse, all right? If you are in an abusive situation and your intimate partner curses you out at the Christmas party at work, everybody sees that they got issues, right? They see what you're dealing with at home. They see what you're dealing with away from work in a place where you should be able to be safe. But if it's subtle and you're getting cussed out, at home as you get dressed for the for the holiday party and if you get cussed out in the car on the way to the holiday party and certain parameters are put in place before you get there all right then they appear to be jovial and warm and friendly and you appear to be acting standoffish and weird okay so that's one example of why the 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 psychological abuse that happens undercover is more damaging because it makes the victim present a certain way to everyone else. And it's completely inaccurate. It's completely inaccurate, okay? And a lot of times in ministry, you'll see this with, with um, ministry leaders and their wives or their husbands. Where one of them is outgoing and jovial and everybody loves them and they're warm. And hey, you know, I feel comfortable with them. And this is my spiritual father and blah, blah, blah. And the wife won't even open her mouth. She appears to be standoffish. She appears to be stuck on herself or arrogant or she thinks she's better than everybody else. When in fact, she's been given very clear orders before she left the house or she's been subjected to a tongue lashing in the car on the way to church. So she understands that she better not say anything and she looks like she's the problem. She looks like she's the problem. When in fact, he may be the problem. Or reverse those roles the other way around. Okay, so things are often not what they appear. They're often not what they appear, okay? It's important for us to remember that. So subtle psychological abuse is more damaging because it undermines the credibility of the victim. There's no reason that people in your life can identify for you being isolative, for you being quiet or withdrawn, for you being irritable or standoffish. They don't have a frame of reference. They don't understand why because you are connected to this amazing person who's friendly and who only says positive things about you and praises you in public. Listen, the fact that a partner is being praised in public, being praised over the pulpit, I'm telling you what I know, don't mean that the victim's not catching hell at home. Okay? So don't be fooled by that. Don't be fooled by the accolades. <laughs> don't be fooled by the accolades. And if a person is acting strangely, there's a reason for that. What is the reason? What is really going on? Okay. So, seven out of ten psychologically abused women display PTSD symptoms and or depression. So, seven out of ten display it. Now, what does that mean? What does that mean? Anyone who is subjected over time to psychological abuse feels some impact of that. A healthy person who experiences psychological abuse is pulling up out of that. They're not putting up with that. They recognize, hold up, you can't, you can't address me that way. You will not talk to me that way and have a relationship with me at the same time, okay? At the same time, okay? And I remember telling somebody one time, I'm going to need for you to pick a struggle because you're trying to do too much. You need to pick a struggle. What you're not going to do is what you just did. If that happens again, all bets are off, Okay? All bets are off. We're not going to have a come to Jesus meeting. We're not going to have no prayer meeting. What you're not going to do is disrespect me and maintain a position in my life. Those two things are mutually exclusive. Okay? And so you've got to have healthy boundaries in place so that you can recognize when these things attempt to creep in. Now, from a spiritual perspective... If you have grown up in an abusive household, or if you've experienced it later in childhood, if you've experienced it in adulthood, if you've experienced it as a teen when you were dating, you have been set up 
to accept it when it shows up later on in life. You've been set up because it's familiar. So you've been set up to accept it. You've been set up to make excuses for it. Because if you don't make excuses for it, it's like you're condemning the ones who mistreated you prior, right? And so there's a tendency to want to make excuses, want to make excuses, want to make excuses. We need to have a zero tolerance mindset regarding abuse in all of the forms that it takes, no matter who is doing it, no matter who is doing it. It doesn't matter. Those of you who know me know I don't make any exceptions. There's a few things nobody gets to do and stay in my life, period. No exceptions. I don't care how long I've known you. It doesn't matter. We could have been in the sandbox together. It doesn't matter. There are certain things you will not do and maintain a relationship with me, period. Unapologetically. Unap I'm telling you, when you get healthy boundaries in place, you can hold on to your peace. From a spiritual perspective, if the enemy can get you to accept being treated poorly, to accept it, over time you begin to embrace it and you begin to believe that you deserve it. What is the problem with that? The problem with that is it is contrary to what the word of God already declares about you. So now you're disagreeing with God about what you deserve. Think about that. There can't be a positive outcome to that. There, there can't be a positive outcome to that. Okay. So understand that you have value. Understand that no one deserves to be subjected to psychological abuse understand that you will be subjected to it until you decide you're no longer willing to be subjected to it, okay? What we tolerate is what we continue to experience. And if we don't say anything about it, in the world of government, it's called tacit agreement. You agree because you say nothing. You agree it's okay because you say nothing, okay? So, 7 out of 10 psychologically abused women display PTSD symptoms and or depression. Now, when you're talking about post-traumatic stress disorder or you're talking about clinical depression, there are certain criteria that have to be met. It doesn't mean that you had a sad mood one day and then you don't get diagnosed with depression because of that. There has to be a frequency and there has to be an intensity and it has to be over a certain amount of time to qualify for these diagnosis, right? PTSD or depression. If seven out of 10 meet the criteria, how many out of 10 just fall short of the criteria? They haven't experienced the mood disorder long enough. They haven't demonstrated the symptoms or enough of them over a long enough period of time. It doesn't mean that three out of 10 are scot-free. It means that three out of 10 didn't rise to the, the criteria to receive a diagnosis of post-traumatic stress disorder or depression, okay? Now, women experiencing psychological abuse are more likely to, re to report poor mental and physical health and have more than five doctor visits in the last year. So there's a tendency for people who are undergoing psychological abuse and this is very tricky because it'll seem like your body's breaking down because of the stress and because of the pressure and because of what you're telling yourself about your value as a human being. So if you're constantly running to the doctor, you are constantly sick, your immune system appears to be compromised. If somebody walks past you with the cold, you catch it. What is going on? If you are sick all the time, if you are sad all the time, if you... Um, you have anhedonia. You don't enjoy the things that you used to enjoy. What is happening? So I submit to you that if this is you, that you look at your circle. Who is around you? Who's around you? How are they treating you? How are they not treating you? Maybe they're not cussing you out directly. Maybe they withdraw from you. Maybe they're not arguing with you. Maybe they're never there for you in ways that are meaningful to you. So you want to look at your circle and determine, am I entertaining something that is depleting me? Okay. And that's important. It's important that you don't just look for somebody to blame, but that you look to see how am I contributing to this? Am I entertaining a relationship that is just draining me, draining me, draining me, draining me? Okay. Am I, um, especially those of us who, who love people and want to help people, am I talking to someone who talks to me for hours 
never wants to listen to the advice that I give them, but then wants to call me back when the bottom falls out again. Okay? Because if you're continuing to entertain that, then you are complicit in your own demise. Okay, so we have to use wisdom in terms of how we interact with others, if it's a healthy interaction, and it's okay if it's over your head. It's okay if you're not skilled to address it. Refer, refer, refer. Send them to someone who is better equipped, okay? Send them to someone who doesn't have as much going on, but stop allowing yourself to be depleted, okay? All right. What else do I want you to know today? We're still talking about the impact of psychological abuse. Psychological abuse is a stronger predictor of PTSD than physical abuse among women. Psychological abuse. So it's not the women that experience the physical abuse, right, that are guaranteed to have PTSD. The psychological abuse. And it's insidious because... With psychological abuse, there's no physical thing to look at. You're not being hit. You're not being punched. You're not being slapped. You're not being strangled. Things like that. But the psychological abuse can be so in-depth and so intense, okay, that it makes you look crazy to other people, all right, and which undermines your ability to then get help, okay? Red flags. Are you a victim of psychological abuse? I'm going to throw some things out here. Does your partner cause you to feel guilt over things that you have no control over? Do they cause you to feel guilt over things that you have no control over? Now, it could be that something has occurred and you didn't handle it right at the time. The reality of it is you can't do anything about that now. You can't do anything about that now, right? We're not talking about just that you're making the right decision at the right time. If you made a decision that you regret, there's nothing you can do about what you've already decided, what things have, have been set in motion because of that decision. And so for someone to badger you about that is psycho psychologically abusive. There's nothing you can do about it now. Nothing you can do about it now. That includes a disagreement or an argument. If you have a disagreement with an intimate partner or a sibling or a cousin or whoever, and let's just say, because we're not perfect, let's just say that you say something that you shouldn't have said, right? All you can do is apologize sincerely. There's nothing you can do about what you've already said. You can move forward and learn and do better. You can accept responsibility for having hurt or harmed someone with the words that came out of your mouth. We know that our words are spirit, that our words are powerful, that we have what we say, okay? And so what we say is important. We can acknowledge that, but you can't take it back. There's nothing you can do about it. It's already been said. And so... The other party needs to make a decision about can they go forward with you armed with that information, that there's nothing you can do to change what's already been said. Okay, this is just an example. Once you've apologized, because here's where the psychological abuse comes in. You've done something, you've said something, you've accepted responsibility, you've accepted the consequences of it, you have done all that you can to make it right. There's no way you can call those words back. And every time you turn around, you're being reminded of the thing that you did, the thing that you said, that you've sincerely apologized for, that you've been accountable for, that you've accepted consequences for. Okay, that's psychological abuse because there's nothing else that you can do about it. Okay, another example of psychological abuse would be being accused of something that you have not done. If you haven't done it, all you can do is say, I haven't done it. If you feel so inclined, you can offer evidence that you haven't done it, okay? You can offer evidence that you haven't done it. But there's nothing else that you can do about it. If you didn't do it, you can't not do it harder. You understand what I'm saying? So for that to be brought to your attention, every time you turn around, that is psychologically abusive. 
that is psychologically abusive. For you to be reminded of something that you've done or said, or to be reminded of something that you haven't done, so there's nothing you can do about something that you haven't done because you didn't do it. They have to decide whether to accept that or not. And you have to decide if you can deal with that or not. Okay? We're still talking about psychological abuse. Okay. For those of you who are commenting, I appreciate it. I won't be able to address everything that you're saying right now, but I promise I will go back as soon as we are done and I will address your comments. Amen. Make sure that you share, like, do a watch party, etc. Okay. Um, does your partner blame you for everything that goes wrong? Everything that goes wrong is your fault. It's something that you did or you did not do. Do they stalk you? Okay. And as I've mentioned before, January is National Stalking Awareness Month. Um, and so we're going to be talking about stalking extensively during the month of January because it is very, very, very serious. And as I've stated previously, if you are being stalked by a current or former intimate partner, they are more likely to murder you than just a complete random stranger stalking you, okay? Because they feel like they've invested in you and they are convinced that they have a right to you and you're telling them no. So we're going to talk about that um, in more detail in January. And if you go back in our archives, we have done a discussion about stalking in the past, okay? Does your partner threaten to take away your children, okay? Are they constantly criticizing you? Do they demean you or ridicule you in public or private? We've already talked about that. Do they isolate you from family or friends? Do they threaten to harm you, your children, your pets, your friends, or your family? If you tell anybody what's going on in this house, I'm going to hurt your mother. I'm going to kill your dog. I'm going to harm your best friend. I'm going to do something. So remember now, psychological abuse involves the, the act but also the threat of perpetrating these acts is psychologically abusive. It's designed to get you to go along with being treated poorly, okay? Do they tell you that you are worthless and that no one else will ever love you? Or do they tell you no one will ever love you like I do, okay? That's a very, very common, common thing. Um, and when coupled with isolation, it's easy to begin to buy into that. It's easy to begin to believe it. It's easy to begin to accept that no one's going to love you the way that they love you, okay? Now, love doesn't hurt. That's not love. Love does not hurt on purpose. Love does not hurt and make excuses for it because they were dropped on their head at birth or because they had a bad day at work or because they have a drug problem or because they have an alcohol problem. That's not love. That's not love. Those are excuses. That's not love, okay? Now, do they tell you that you are crazy? That It might sound something like this. Now, you know, you've been acting really strange since your mama died. You've been acting really strange since you got that job. You've been acting really weird since you started going to that church. You know that's a cult, right? And they're affecting the way you interact with people. And they're affecting the way you interact with family members. And I'm really, really concerned that maybe you should get counseling. Okay, that's what that sounds like. Do they threaten your employment or your credentials? Do they call your workplace, okay? Or here's an example of this, and this happens often. Now remember I said that 65, if, if a woman makes 65% of the household income, she is more likely to be the victim of psychological abuse. Now, it might look something like this. Let's just say you're a ministry leader and you have a license, you have cred credentials. You are a real estate agent. You are a psychiatrist. You are an attorney. You have, you have employment that relies on licensing or credentialing from a board, a state board, a national board. Psychological abuse might look like this. If you don't give me what I want, or if you don't start to act right, okay, I'm going to call the board and I'm going to tell them that you did this to the kids. I'm going to call the board and I'm going to tell them blah blah blah. I'm going to call your supervisor. I'm going to email all your co-workers and I'm going to tell them xyz. That's psychological abuse. You're an attorney. I'm going to call them and tell them that you have a drug problem. You are 
a doctor, I'm going to tell them that you are molesting your patients. Okay? You are a social worker. I'm going to accuse you of molesting children. And so what a person with an abusive disposition, an abusive personality understands is there are certain allegations that once they are launched, they must be investigated. So the damage is potentially done. And you may come through an investigation, okay, but the fact that the allegation has even been made, what you understand is someone out there is going to always question if you're guilty of that or not. And so that is psychological abuse. That's what psychological abuse looks like, okay? That is something that can be done to you without even touching you. Um, and your response to it can appear to be over the top and irrational, okay? And make you feel a little crazy. Now, does your partner tell you that you're crazy? Do they suggest that you're crazy? Do they suggest that you need counseling? When you are, in fact, responding to being psychologically abused, all right? Do they threaten your employment or your credentials? They're going to call your workplace. They're going to call your supervisor. They're going to talk to your coworkers. They're going to talk to your best friend. Oftentimes, the, 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 the trap is laid by dropping little lies and exaggerations into the ears of people that you're close to to cause them to start watching your behavior and when you respond to psychological abuse and they come across as caring and supportive and jovial um, and loving mankind then you look crazy to the people closest to you because of your behavior this is why it's important that you talk about what you are experiencing, that you document what you are experiencing, what is being said to you, what is going on, so that you can establish that your response is to something very real that is occurring, okay? Now, some resources for you are the National Domestic Violence Hotline, um, and that number is 1-800-799-7233. Again, that's 1-800-799-7233. Um, or 1-800-799 and the word SAFE, S-A-F-E. Um, online, it's thehotline.org. And the good thing about them is that you can chat with them if you're not in a position where you can talk to them because the person who was mistreating you is nearby. Then there's a chat feature that you can exit. And you can exit safely so that they can't check your browsing history and know that you've been there, okay? So that's important. You want to be safe. Um, and I just want to remind you that there are other avenues out there. There are um, domesticshelters.org. There is another Facebook group called Stand Up Survivor. We have a closed Facebook group called Dominion Over Domestic Violence. It's a closed group. Uh, we keep it small intentionally. Uh, lots of professionals in there. There are people in there who are victims. There are people in there who have been victims. There are people there who are currently um, living in an abusive situation, whether it's psychologically abusive or physically abusive or sexually abusive, and they don't feel quite ready to exit. Okay, so it's an amazing support system. There are ministry leaders in there. There are professional people in there. We've got psychologists in there. We've got social workers in there. Um, some who were there to receive support and some who are there to give support. Um, and it's possible that you join us and you your idea is to give support and then you come to realize that you need support and that's okay. That's fine. Okay. So that group is called Dominion Over Domestic Violence. And again, we've been directed by the Lord to keep that small uh, because it's not possible to really ensure the safety of victims if you have a thousand people in a group. That's too many people. And I guarantee you, you've got perpetrators in there pretending to be victims looking for their significant other, trying to figure out where their support is coming from. Okay. So we're going to keep it small, uh, but just know that Dominion Over Domestic Violence is available to you if you are looking for a private, closed, faith-based group, okay? Um, if you don't believe in God, we're going to just aggravate you in there because we do a talk about him and how amazing he is, okay, and how much we rely on him. Um, and then there's Against All Odds Domestic uh, Violence Grassroots you know, Support. There's Why Not Domestic Violence. There is safe harm, safe in harm's way. Um, and so there are lots of resources out there. That's my point. Um, you can feel free to inbox us. You can 
uh, send me a friend request to my Facebook page, the one that this is airing on primarily, uh, Cheryl Richardson. I have another page, Apostle Cheryl L. Richardson. And then we have um, Line of Judah, Global Impact Ministries. Hey, Prophet Roger. Hey, Johnny. Um, so there are resources available, okay? More so than ever before, there are resources. So there's no reason for you to stay ensnared in an abusive situation. Um, feel Like I said, feel free to inbox us. Um, we'll be back next week uh, with another discussion. We appreciate your input. We appreciate those of you who sow and who invest in us. We appreciate it. The vision that the Lord has given us um, is expansive. Uh, we can't do it without him and we can't do it without you. And so even if you're not a person who feels that you can invite someone into your home who may be in an unhealthy situation, who may be experiencing an abusive relationship, you can share this video. You can sew. You can help us to do what we're doing. Okay. And so get involved. Get involved. We need your involvement. When you see the videos pop up, share them. Share them to everyone on your timeline. You never know. I've had professional people reach out to me and say, I had no idea about this. Different aspects that we've talked about. I had no idea about gaslighting. I didn't even know what that was. And these are people who are professional people. All right? So we want to leave you with this thought. Anyone can be a victim. And anyone can be an abuser. So don't believe that because someone is a professional, because they're well thought of in the community, that they can't possibly be a victim of domestic violence. Don't get hung up in the mistaken belief that because someone appears to be jovial and outgoing and loves people and they contribute to the community um, and they, you know, they do things for others, that they can't possibly be an abuser, okay? If we can just get past those two things, we'll be better able to recognize how we can help those around us. So this is Apostle Cheryl Richardson. I appreciate you tuning in. I appreciate you sharing and your comments. Love you much. Know that I am praying for you, okay? That God will bless your life tremendously, that you will walk fully in your purpose, that you will walk fully in your destiny, amen? Um, and we'll be back next week with another Shatter the Silence, Stop Domestic Violence. Amen. Blessings to you.